I'm so glad to be here. And as I told Chris, I sort of bit off more than I could chew with this subject. I should have stuck to just bulbs, just the geophytes. But, you know, you have to talk about corms, and then you have to talk about rhizomes, and then you have to talk about tubers and tubers roots, and then you go into a new category, which is the fleshy roots, and you just go, okay. But it's been fun. I have learned a lot. Um, it's been, I mean, a lot of these I have, a lot of these are my pictures, so they're not fancy, fancy pictures, but a lot of them are mine. So we're going to just talk about all different kinds of things. Uh, bulb, bulb, corn. And a bulb, where we're going to go to the next one, then just everybody recognizes tulips, dahlias, iris. Uh, all different forms and shapes of what's underneath the ground. I love this definition. Any plant that stores its complete life cycle underground storage structure. And that is what a true bulb is. It's funny because doing this research, you go through and you go, okay, this calls it a bulb. And then you go, no, and you start looking, it's not really a true bulb, it's a corm or it's a rhizome. And then you have to sort of do what you need to do to find out. These are hyacinths, you probably recognize those. This is why this is a complete life cycle. You have the basal plate where the roots come from. These little things that look like the outside of an onion are the uh, food storage in there. And then this little thing right here is the flower bud and then the main stem that will come out the center. And most bulbs do have what they call tunicated. They're, they have the papery look on the outside of it. Lilies do not have that. True lilies have just the outside scales, which makes planting lilies, buying lilies and planting lilies a little more difficult because they'll dry out very quickly. With the paper on the outside, the tunic that they're talking about here, that protects it. Um, and you will see that I have some sad examples up here, things that have been out of the ground since like November, and they're still viable. Um, sad but true um, that I did that to them. True bulbs, again, this is um, daffodil bulb, or um, tulip bulbs, thank you. With, and they show you this basal plate, that's where the roots come from. And then again, it's just another picture of there's the color of that. And then the old leaves are what's the tunic on the outside. Then you get into corms. And that's really cool. They are, um, oops, all right. Okay, push the wrong button. The corm is this right here. This is last year's corm, and then this is the corm before that. So they build on top of each other. So I know people say, well, my um, gladiolas work their way out of the ground. Well, that's why. Because they just sort of build on top of each other. They, the, their roots do pull them down, but eventually, that's one of the reasons you need to dig them up and replant them in a lot of cases. Um, if you put a lot of mulch on them, that might keep it from happening. This one is sort of flat, and he's very badly developed. You see how nice and fat this guy is? And that's the way they're supposed to look. And then this is the stem of the old one, and you can see. And those are little snow crocus, put their heads out in about January and February. Rhizomes are lateral stems that are barely underground or can be yeah, a little bit deeper in the ground. Um, the most common one that everybody knows about is iris. Uh, it is a stem that has the roots coming down. This is food storage, and then the shoots come up here, and that's where your flowers will be. Tubers, um, there are two different kinds. You have your stem tuber, which is a true tuber, and then you have your tuberous roots, which is like a dahlia or sweet potatoes. You can, on the potato, a true tuber, you can get roots and shoots from all the eyes that are on the potato, but in a tuberous root, they will not, under most circumstances, put out anything. So you have to take your tuber off with the little eye that's right there. See the little buds right in there? You have to pull that off with a bud on it so that it will grow. But if you've got six tubers, you've got six plants. Now they, a couple of places added a new category, and since I happen to love peonies, I put them in there because I wanted to. Fleshy roots. And I always 
thought that a peony was a tuber. I mean, that's what they look like, those very strange fat things, food storage, but they are not really a, technically a tuber, so they are, um, uh, they call them just fleshy roots. But you can see the little eyes coming off and these roots are coming down. Food storage uh, with, a, with a peony, when you divide them, you need to have at least three eyes on your uh, t whatever part of the root you can. So you want one, two, I think there's one over there, three to take that and then there's one, two, three there. So that's a two, that's a two for there. Peonies don't like to be divided that much. I moved them and had great success, but once they're in the ground, they're not like a lot of other plants that you have to divide every so often. Of course, Chris said he hasn't divided anything in forever, and I'm sort of in that category. I'm uh, dividing my row of iris that I have, uh, my pink iris, and I'm slowly dividing them because I'm digging them up for demonstrations and for propagation workshops and stuff like that. <laughs> so I'm just out there digging them up and so they can have some room. Uh, daylilies are the other thing that has the fleshy roots, and everybody knows about daylilies. They're just, you either love them or you hate them. I happen to think they're wonderful. And I have a friend that, you know, does this when you say daylily to her, and she, she does not a, she's not a daylily fan. But they also have the fleshy roots. And I have um, some examples of little uh, Celidae ores up here, and afterwards, y'all are welcome to come up here and peruse what we've got, and if you want any of them, you can take them home, too. Um, and I have, the, um, I have the lily up here, and you can see that it doesn't have the paper. When you come up, you can see that it doesn't have the paper. And on this one, it has a little bulb that's starting to form on the stem. All the roots are here, but this was the original bulb right there. And then there's another little uh, bulblet, what they call them. He's right there. Set that. And he looks that weird because he's in a pot. I was supposed to plant them last year and they never got planted. <laughs> so he's still in a, one of those giant pots and I have them all in there. When you're selecting a bulb, um, the common sense is you want them large and firm and no signs of any kind of fungus on them or critters chewing on them. Um, if it's squishy, it's probably got a problem and it's probably not going to be healthy. If they're very small, they're either not going to have flowers or they may not have very large flowers or maybe only one stem or two. I have some crocus up here and isn't that sad? That's all there is to it right there. That teeny tiny, not as big as your little fingernail right there because they were jam packed. So they're very small they will bloom. Then on the bottom part of this, I have where you can feel and see that the old corm is on the bottom and the new corm is forming on the top and the bottom one's a little squishy and the top one is nice and firm. So that's a great way to see uh, how a corm sits on top of itself. Daffodils, again, they have beautiful flowers, but look how small that bulb is, you know itty bitty little guy because they need to be divided but there's one right there that has um, a, ba a daughter bulb coming off of the side of it you can get bulbs at the big box stores you can get them at really good nurseries uh, you can also find them in open um, containers where you can get as many as you want or pick out exactly what you want that's what I did with these um, elephant ears that I had their corns uh, I just picked out a couple that so people could see a really big bulb corn but you can get them all over the place and um, if you're looking to do a lot of flowers that's great plant catalogs seed catalogs the bulb catalogs that come and they're bulbs that you'll see we'll talk about bulbs that you plant in the summertime or in the um, so that they bloom in the summer and then into the winter time because well, the ones we're used to are the crocus and the daffodils that you plant in November and they come up in um, February and March but there are lots of bulbs that come out during the summertime uh, 
sun is only important if it's a summertime bulb. It's not as important when they're daffodils or crocus because in most cases, the deciduous trees or the deciduous shrubs that they're under have lost their leaves, so all the sun comes in. They can take care of that with the, when the soil warms up from the sun. The uh, little sprouts come up. They get all the sun because the leaves aren't out by the time they've bloomed and they're starting to go back down. Uh, the leaves are coming out, and it's a great uh, cycle there. Most, oops, most of the time, you want to plant most bulbs three to four times the depth of the bulb. If it's a two inch bulb, then it would be more like six to eight inches in there. Uh, except major exceptions are um, iris, who barely like to be under the ground, and peonies. In our area, we need to plant them as high as possible because they need as much chilling as they can get to bloom properly. So if you have a peony that's not blooming properly, the first thing to look at would be seeing if it's too low in the ground, may have to dig it back out. I had a um, Bartzilla that did not bloom this year very well and I got to looking at it and I've had some we're working on my slope in the front and it had packed around the bottom of my plant. So I am pulled that back and hopefully we'll have pretty bush next year. You also have um, all kinds of tools. You have these handheld things here. You have little step ones that you can step on. You have augers that you can put on your drill so you can drill small holes or larger holes. The best thing if you're planting a lot of bulbs is to dig beds. Uh, dig them down a little bit deeper than what you're going to plant your bulb. Unlike most plantings for most plants, we want to plant that at the same level as the pot. But with bulbs, you want to have it if you're going to put it at six inches, you want to go maybe eight inches deep so those little roots can get down there because they have to grow quickly and do their thing because most of these plants are very short-lived outside. So you want to get a nice soft bed underneath them. Uh, phosphorus is one of the things you can add down at the soil, at the root level to help uh, with, with the plant. Other than that, just 10-10, 10, 10, 10, three tens. Everybody's seen this, but I think it's very fun because you can do things like daffodils or the, cro well, not crocus, but daffodils and tulips. Tulips are not really a, uh, more than maybe two or three years. But I put this in the blue juniper, rug juniper there, and they just come through, flower, and then when they die back, you don't even know they're there. But they come up, and then they start as it gets warmer, and there you go with that. And this picture to that picture, I think this year was just about four weeks, five weeks. But that's what it usually would be, about four weeks if it's warmer, if you got a lot of sunshine, six weeks if we have a really cold early spring or late winter. And then you have, um, this is my neighbor's yard, and she just has them all over. They come up, and then as soon as they're starting to go away, all her other plants start coming up. It's just beautiful back there because she has lots of different colors. I particularly like the single, not the doubles, because the doubles tend to make them a little heavier, and they sort of look at the ground instead of look at you. In this picture, you can see that there are some back here that have not started to bloom yet, and that's because they're in heavy wood in the area. So they don't get a whole lot of sun even when the leaves are off the tree, so they're farther behind. They will be, um, after these guys were just about finished, these little guys in the back were starting to come out. So you get a progression of bloom. <coughs> and with the daffodils, if you look at your catalogs, you can get early daffodils, mid-season, late, and uh, so you can have three months, four months of daffodils if you plan it right. In the spring, the early spring, these are the harbingers right here. Um, you've got your pretty uh, crocus right there. Uh, on your handout, there's a little star by the ones that are up here. This would be the, in the spring section, because there's another crocus that is in the winter section. Um, of course, the hyacinths, you just can't argue with the smell and the beauty of those. 
um, the um, onion, which is what this is, they will, they're all different kinds. These are the huge, the giganticum. But um, you have the little bitty ones. I know Millennium was like a plant of the year a couple of years ago. Um, they're just, and they come in nice full balls like this or sort ones that look sort of like sparklers. Um, and I'm probably gonna pronounce it wrong. Ground orchids, Latilla, is that right? I love these things. They are so fun. Beautiful colors. Uh, they come in everything from white to a very deep purple. Their, their little uh, fan-like leaves come up almost too early. Occasionally you do have to cover them so that they don't get frosted. But when they start blooming, they have these beautiful orchid-like uh, flowers on them. And I was told they like lots of shade. They do fine in the shade, but i am got two out in full sun right now, and they seem to be doing very well. <coughs> So that opens up a whole new world when you can put things in shade and sun. And I like them, so that's one of my... A lot of people call or ask what happens when the frost comes or it gets really cold, do they have to cover up their plants? Um, but these early plants, Mother Nature already knows they're going to get frosted, they're going to get frozen. And so this was one morning and I came out and these poor little guys were all flopped over on the ground and you can see all of the frost on the uh, mulch there. And that afternoon when I got home, there they both are standing up straight and smiling at everybody. Mm -hmm. They just know that it's time to uh, just, when they're cold, they just fall over so that they're not going to get frozen <laughs> solid. And then they come back out with the sunshine. This are daffodils that, um, this you can see the frost in the background and all these guys with their faces in the dirt. That afternoon, almost all of them are up, but you can see this is the, exactly the same day. I, I thought I was in the right spot, but slightly different angle. But the very next day, because it was still sort of shady and cloudy that day and still cool, the very next day was a bright, sunny, warm day. And all but these three and those three were all straight up and smiling at the world. So they, they're used to that. It's not a big deal. Um, you don't have to worry about your daffodils and hyacinths, crocus. You get into the, your summer bulbs, and there are all kinds of beautiful things to have. Uh, you're, you have a list. Um, you can't, just can't put them all in a slide. Of course, the peony, and there's a peony there, and there's a peony there, and they're just so beautiful. I love them. Um, that one has a great smell. That one doesn't smell as good as it should. <laughs> Dahlias, which in this area, a lot of them are hardy. If you plant them in areas, a lot of them you can actually leave in the ground. Some of them you will have to dig up, but there are dahlias now that, you know, if you put them in the right spot, if you cover them in the wintertime, they will be able to come back. Um, but you have to read and sometimes you get a weak one that won't make it. Other times you'll get one that will just fly through the winter. These are crinums, and that's what everybody calls a pass-along plant because they're an old-fashioned plant. Uh, they usually smell wonderful. They come in all different colors now from white to pink and stripes. Uh, they have a odd bulb. I have a picture um, at the end of Everybody's probably familiar with an amaryllis bulb, how it's pretty round and just sort of peaks up. These guys are more slender with a taller neck that sticks out of the ground more. But they can multiply and then you just go in and dig them out and put them around your yard some more or give them to your neighbors or have a, have a, a good time giving them to people that need to start growing different things. Lilies, huge group, and there are two different kinds, main kinds of lilies. They're Asiatic lilies, and then they're Oriental lilies. And the other day, somebody asked, um, what's the difference? And the people that were answering it didn't come up with the right answer. The right answer is, Asiatic is the first letter of the alphabet, so Asiatics come up first. And being that they're first, they're not quite as tall as the Orientals. They can be some very tall ones, four or five feet. 
Um, but most of them are in the three to four foot range and they don't have any fragrance. Um, the um, oriental lilies, because it's an O, they have odor, so they have a great smell. And they are later, so that means that they are, they, I mean, I don't know why they are taller, but they are. I just figured it's because they have more time to, to grow. But they are usually your taller ones in the four to six foot range. Your tiger lilies are in that same type of category. In that. And I think this is a tiger lily, um, little bulbils, little, you let them ripen, and they're just little plants hanging out there. They'll actually put out roots, and then when they fall in the ground, onto the ground, their roots will just pull them into the ground, and you've got a new, a new plant. So that, that is just so, so cool. And of course, this is a stargazer lily. This is an oriental lily, and it's a stargazer, and you can see that that butterfly is having a good lunch. Iris, another huge category. You can't go wrong. I mean, they're like roses. I've never seen an ugly iris. I mean, I, and, and I got an iris catalog not too long ago when I was flipping through it and I had to drink water because I was getting dehydrated drooling over them. <laughs> Just so beautiful. Um, I know these are all purple and lavender. I have to like that color, but you can see. Oh, oh sorry. This one is a uh, rebloomer, and you can see that it's fall. And this guy is just blooming his head off, um, just, just gorgeous. So rebloomers, you all have a bunch of rebloomers here now, don't you? Yep. Okay. Um, but they come in all different colors, everything in the world that you can think of. But you know, look at that. I mean, that's so beautiful and so intense, so pretty. And I have um, iris up here. That's a rhizome. And I have um, one sample here where you can see where I dug it up. And you can see that here's the old part of the rhizome. It's a little squishy, not too bad. This one's nice and firm, but then it has these new ones coming off. And with iris, as long as you have a fan, you can pull these apart, let it dry just for a minute or two, and then you can plant it back in the ground and you'll have, uh, you might even get a third one if you use the center, but you have at least two babies off of this one right there. You said as long as you plant them right away, can you leave them out of the ground for a spell? <laughs> yes, sir. Unfortunately, that's what I did. I forgot in a propagation class, I had taken some of my iris and showed people how to do that. And then I put them back in the bag and I put the bag in the closet and I forgot about it. And that talk was in November. But these little guys, you can see their, their leaves are pretty pitiful, but they all have little new rhizomes coming out of the side, um, new roots coming off of the bottom. All I did was put them in water two days ago and they're already starting to go, it's about time you remembered I was in this dark closet. So they will grow, they'll be fine. Now they probably will not bloom for at least a year, maybe two, because they're gonna have to re-energize their rhizomes for their food source. But. They will, no, so you, no, the answer to your question is no, you don't have to plant them right away. You do need to have to take better care of them than I did. <laughs> and the, usually the best time to do um, division of iris, according to the Iris Society, is in August and September. So that's, I don't know why, it's so hot <laughs> then, but of course they love the heat. Some more fun things, cannas. And in this area, we're very fortunate because we have people that do cannas and they are every color imaginable for the leaves. The flowers are almost, in some cases, secondary because the leaves can be this gorgeous, uh, deep burgundy color. They're the striped ones, they're orange. They have some that have yellow and green stripes. And then the flowers range everything from white until uh, to deep red. And they're uh, very hardy in most cases and they're a rhizome and they will spread. This is, I put this in there because this is one of those reminders to myself as well as you, I know better than this and I did it anyway. We had um, a problem with water coming down a slope, not a heavy slope, but a slope enough and it was lots of water. So we built a berm here, about three feet tall and we decided to plant 19 knockout roses along that road. 
absolutely gorgeous. In the spring, when they first started blooming, I would sit downwind of them and just be in heaven because of the smell. And of course, at the same time, the iris are coming out and that pink against that deep uh, reddish pink in the background, just beautiful. But like with all monocultures, you have an issue with diseases and pests. So one day I come out and I'm looking at my beautiful roses and I see rose rosette disease. So all 19 roses had to come out. So it's not a good idea to do that. I paid the price. Now I enjoyed them for the few years they were there, but you know, you pay the price when you, when you put them on a culture. You really need to break it up so that if a pest does get in there or if a de de disease does get in there, a lot of times they're transferred by the roots. So if you have one root next to the other, you're just gonna go right down the line. If you have a one kind of plant here and another one here and another one here, the roots aren't touching, so you're less likely to lose the other ones down the row. Um, that way, if you have to replace one, you only have to replace that guy, and it doesn't look like you had to, what I had to do was start all over again. Of course, the iris are still there, but those are the ones that I'm digging up and separating now. Um, this, they now call it, and in the iris family, domestica, I think is what they call it. I've always heard them called blackberry lilies and they were in a family that began with a B, was a long word, can't pronounce. But these are really fun. They're in, they are in like an iris. They have a rhizome and they have that nice fan. But then when these flowers come out, I mean, they're so interesting. They come in different colors. Some of them are bright orange. Some of them are yellow. I had one at one time that had a purple tinge to it, which is really pretty. I will tell you that somebody killed it for me. But um, they're lots of fun. And when the, the flowers fade and the seed pod comes out, when it opens up, it pops open and it looks like it has a blackberry in the middle of it. The seeds are black and all clustered. So that's where it gets its name, Blackberry Lily. And they're lots of fun. I really, and they, they do seed some, but they're easy to pull up if you don't want them where they are. I think everybody probably knows that these are the hot pokers. Um, this particular one is Lola. She gets to be about that big. Um, lots of fun. And they come in again, all different colors, <laughs> all different sizes. You can get the little small ones, the popsicle, and my favorite is called Toffee Nose. Only gets to be about that big, has sort of a tan. I'm not usually a tan person, but I love the tan and the brown together. It's just beautiful. And then you can get the Lolas, which are you know, four to five feet tall. And they do multiply. Um, I forget what they are. I think they're rhizomes. I don't know. I'd have to look at my cheat sheet. Um, but you can take them and divide them when they get a little overcrowded. Um, calla lilies. Uh, we, I have some up here. I have yellow one and red ones. I don't know whether they are hardy. We, I had that question, um, so I'm not 100% sure. This one is Picasso, and he has been in my front yard for probably eight years now, and he comes back just beautifully. This year, I think he had six blooms on him. Uh, starts out a white and then turns into this purple color and just is absolutely beautiful. So when you have it down low, when you're coming by, walking up to the house, you can look down and see that yellow, um, what's it called? This is the space. space. Yes. And uh, it's just so cool to be able to look down in there. The only problem you have with calla lilies, um, leaf rollers. It's the same thing with cannas. Leaf rollers get into cannas. So you have to be very careful, clean up after them, and make sure that you uh, take all the, the problems off your property. Amaryllis, uh, it's funny because most of the websites you read say they're not hardy. Well, we, have, we can have amaryllis. This is my neighbor's amaryllis. She put that in the ground, I think, three years ago. It was a Christmas bulb, and in the spring she stuck it in the ground for the heck of it, and it went through that horrible winter we had. Um, now, it's planted against the house, and it has a lot of protection, but, I mean, she has that beautiful flower. It's already finished blooming uh, now, but she has that beautiful flower right as she's walking into her door. It's just gorgeous, and a lot of them are able to come back, and, and with a little extra care, if you put a little extra mulch on them, 
plant them next to a wall, plant them next to the south side of your house or the west side of your house where they get a little more protection. East side of the house, sorry, protection. And this is one that you can see, it's got the blooms down here are faded, but look at all the ones that are about to come out up here. So it's, it's, not, it's not a long blooming plant, but you get a couple of weeks worth of gorgeous color. What is it? Amaryllis. I have no idea what that one is. It's one of those, no, that's, a, that's an amaryllis. That's an amaryllis? Mm-hmm. Oh. But it comes out in the summer? It comes out in the spring, yeah, summer. Yeah, like I said, my neighbor, um, hers is just finished blooming right now. I know, I thought it looked like a crinum too, yeah. but yeah. it said it was a, and it, um, labeling your plants, you know, because I can't tell you some of the names of them because I said, oh, I'll remember that. I have a new front of my house that I'm putting in with all new plants and just this past week I had a friend come and help me plot out each one of the new plants so that I knew exactly where it was and it's on a piece of paper what the name of it was so that when those tags are gone I will be able to tell you that that's a so-and-so amaryllis or I, I still think it looks like a crinum but it the, the right one's a crinum what the right one's a crinum is it, it just they, she told me it was an amaryllis and she'd gotten it at Christmas. It's an amaryllis family member. So. Well, that's true. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's right. They have crossed those. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's beautiful. It's still, it was blooming in the spring, too. So most crinums are starting now. Um, so anyway, but there's tons of blooms on it. See, see, it's the University of Georgia. And they said it was an amaryllis. <laughs> <laughs> so in the fall, a lot of people go, well, you know, there's nothing out there. It's not, there's no need to really work outside. But fall is a wonderful time to have plants out there. And I put fall and winter together because a lot of these plants are late in the fall, almost into winter. Some of the winter ones can start in the, in the fall and then go through the winter with their leaves. Um, this is the autumn crocus, and it's sort of odd because you see it doesn't really have any true stem stems. They come straight out from the bulb, and they are bloom. We have some at the uh, Waterwise Garden so that we can have blooms in. Does it actually bloom in October? It doesn't, does it? It's after that, isn't it? So it, it's more like November and December, isn't it? But. So, I mean, when you see that popping out of the ground, it's just beautiful. You just smile. This is, um, I, if you, yes, if, it's an if, if you want. And that is a great little plant. It's, it's very small. A lot of these winter plants are very small. It probably doesn't get to be about three inches tall, three, four inches tall. But it has the little leaves that come out. And they're pretty and green and all tangled up like that because they need to be separated. And then the little flowers just come out and they face up and they're looking at you. Uh, they come in all different colors. Um, I have white and this bluish purple. They have some that are a pinkish purple, but um, they're already gone. I had to take a pic. I had to go look at one of my pictures when I wanted to dig up the little bulbs to show you to see where it was because the leaves are even gone. It's it's been dormant since probably the end of March. It was blooming in like January and February. And I have it right beside the sidewalk so when you walk past it, you can see it and it smiles at you. And this is, these are the, like some of them are pretty pitiful. But that's a true bulb. I don't have a true bulb here because I couldn't bring it. But this is a corm. So there's the difference in sizes. There's, I mean, it's just, and this is not the largest bulb you can get. Uh, a lot of the amaryllis bulbs are huge. This is sort of a beginning and the end of the winter. Um, uh, toad lilies right here are usually blooming in November, sometimes as late as December. They almost get frozen. Um, and then these are what you call snow crocus, and they usually are blooming in January and February. 
So they are the very earliest. The cool thing about the snow crocus is that they are very small. Um, you, don't, you can put them in your yard. You don't have to worry about mowing them because they're so short. They usually aren't above most people's grass anyway. I planted a bunch of these around trees um, just so I had color around the trunk of the tree. Well, the trees are gone, but that was 1997, and these little guys are still out in the middle of my yard, and every February, January, they're poking their heads up and smiling at the world, and it's just a lovely thing to go across the yard, and you go, oh, look how beautiful they are. And you can see they're just, they're not hardly any bigger than all the dead stuff in the yard. But those are really nice little ones. And the nice, uh, these guys, like I said, they've been in the ground since 97. And you can see that they have multiplied a little bit, but they haven't multiplied a whole lot. But they're still blooming like crazy. When you have bulbs, there is a little bit of maintenance to them, not a whole lot. Technically, you don't really have to deadhead, but if you have the time and you're avoiding doing something else, it's great to go outside <laughs> and pick the blooms off. And you can just sort of zen out and think your own thoughts and not have to answer the telephone. Um, so that helps. You don't, you don't really want the plants to go to seed. That puts extra energy into the seed, whereas you want the energy to go into the food storage, the bulbs, the corms, rhizomes, whatever their food storage is for the next year. And this, you can see how ugly it is. This is a Lycoris. Um, just starting to fade out, but you, you really are not to mess with those leaves until they are totally brown. So as long as they've got green on them, they're still funneling energy to the bulbs or the corms in the ground. You don't want to cut them. You don't want to, a lot of people will take them and um, fold them over and tie them so they don't look quite so messy. That's not a good thing because all of the leaves need to be producing food, not just the outer ones. And it's so, sort of strange anyway to me <laughs> to see these little clumps in somebody's yard. Um, the way to get by with that is if you're planting them under um, some uh, bush that's a deciduous bush, by about the time they're going away, the leaves are coming out and they'll cover up those uh, not so pretty leaves. Um, or if you put them behind bushes that will be coming out so that you don't really see that uh, yellowing. But it never bothers me. Um, fertilizing. Like I said, a lot of phosphorus is what you want for uh, bulbs, a slightly higher middle number uh, on a, on a uh, fertilizer. If you have good blooming, then you just a regular old 10, 10, 10. And you want to do it just as the plant is breaking the ground. If you wait any longer than that, it won't have enough time to get down into the soil to replenish your bulb. So as soon as they um, just barely come above the soil surface, you can put your fertilizer on there. I don't fertilize. I don't think I fertilize anything in years. And I still have, you know, tons of blooms. Dividing is, um, you can see how crowded they are right there. Still getting lots of blooms, but a lot of times if your blooming is getting less and less, it's probably because they're starting to crowd out and you're getting these teeny little bulbs that don't have but one flower stem on them instead of two or three. So then it's probably time to go and dig them up. And it's easy to do with a, a four tine spading kind of fork, I don't know what you call it, but it's got four tines, it's really heavy, it's really heavy duty, you just put it down under, lift it up, hardly damages anything. Um, a lot of these bulbs, even if they've gotten a bit chunked off of them, if you let it dry, heal just a little bit, they'll still be perfectly fine. But you can dig them up and then replant them immediately, or you can wait until the fall. But you need to store them in a um, cool, semi-dryish place where they're not going to get rotten, single layers. If you don't have many flowers 
or your plant's getting very leggy, um, usually what that means is a not enough sun or really bad soil. And this little plant back here and this little plant right here had both of those. They were underneath um, evergreen, oh, uh, what were they? Junipers. And then these bushes are uh, limelight hydrangeas. So they never saw the daylight. And this one little bloom came out and said, I'm still here. So a lot of those hydrangeas are gone. Um, and the bushes are gone too. And this little guy right here, um, he didn't have any flowers, but he still put his little leaves up. And since he got more sun this spring, hopefully next <coughs> year he will be able to produce a flower for me. Um, and it's also on a hill, and it's really horrible soil. So that's, I mean, that they're alive is just wonderful. And this is where I'm working on that whole hill there. It's a mess. Yellowing is, uh, depending on the time, if it's already come up and it's bloomed and it's yellowing, it's just going dormant. Uh, if it's coming up and it's the yellowish leaves or they're not really pretty bright green, it probably needs some attention. Um, a soil sample is what we always recommend people do. If you don't do a soil sample, then probably a, just a general 10-10-10 uh, fertilizer will help. But um, a lot of times you really need a soil test to figure out exactly whether you've got not enough nitrogen or whether you have too much uh, potassium or whether it's not enough phosphorus. Um, so that, the soil, and I have some soil tests. Do I still have soil tests back there? Okay. And it's free until November. After November, it costs again. So these are some articles that I just, thought were really interesting um, and then all the pretty plants that's another amaryllis I don't know whether that one's hardy or not that was just so pretty these are real butter yellow iris so nice and then that was just my real pretty pink and then that's the Picasso there were two of the blooms I had three more four more I think that were down low Then this was where I was talking about the crinum. See how long its neck is? And then there's the little bulb right there. Um, so you can see, and it's just, my friend gave me these. Um, she dug them up. I don't know where, don't ask. Um, and they're supposed to be a deep burgundy color. So I'm really excited about that. She gave me two of them. And then this was an, um, uh, it's not an amaryllis, it was, can't remember what it is, but it went dormant. It's just in a pot, and you can already see that there's another one. And it was in that pot just one year, and it already has a little baby coming up from it. It has a yellow flower. I got it. I can't remember what it's called now. Oh well, sorry. Um, but it was really cool. It's not. It's a zone eight plant, so that's why I kept it in the pot. I wanted it to grow for a year before I tried sticking it in the ground to see if I could get it to overwinter. So, any questions? Was it a clivia? I'm sorry? Was it a clivia? Oh, it might be. I think no, clivia are less hardy. It's a yellow. It could be yellow. It could be coming yellow. Oh, do they? Because I, I, I'm not really sure. I forget where I was when I got it. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? The asterisk? Yes. What did that mean? Oh, they were in the um, presentation. <coughs> so that you saw pictures of those. Those are the pictures. Yeah, those, those are actually that I had pictures of. I just couldn't keep it to just those few. I wanted to put in a lot more. And, and that's the fun thing about bulbs is most of the time, especially your winter ones, you can place them all over and just be surprised when they pop up every year. And they're more ephemeral than a lot of plants. They come up, they do their thing, and then they go away, and you almost forget they're there until the next year when they pop up, do their thing, and make you happy. So a lot of the, the winter bulbs are ephemerals. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
What was it? Oh, tulips. Oh, yes. They really don't in this area. Uh, most people treat tulips as an annual. If you're lucky, they'll come back once, maybe twice. Um, several reasons. We don't get really cold enough for tulips. And for another reason is that the um, voles and squirrels and stuff tend to love them. So they dig them up and eat them. They don't dig up our daylilies, I mean our daffodils, because they're poisonous and they taste awful. So that's why daffodils are not usually bothered. But tulips, unfortunately, you can keep them away from the um, critters by uh, putting um, permatil on them and planting them with the permatil so that the voles won't get in there, but that won't keep the squirrels out. Um, covering them with um, wire might keep the squirrels away, but they're still probably not gonna last more than a couple of years. And that's, a, that's another thing, the, uh, we showed you the tools of digging holes one at a time, but a lot of times with these bulbs, it's really great to dig a large area up and then just plant them all in there so that they're not in a line, that there's a nice clump of them, and when they come up, the color is really uh, very vibrant instead of just a splash here and there. Depends on what you want, your, your design. Yes, sir? Can you uh, uh, refrigerate the tulip bulbs to prolong their life? Uh, you would have to dig them up? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, dig yeah. them up in the, uh, sure. dig up in June and plant them. Plant again in uh, November. Like a lot of people do for the dahlias and some gladiolus. Um, most, I mean, when I was little, my parents were always digging up the gladiolus and saving them for the next year. So, uh, but here we do have a few gladiolus that will. I think most gladiolus will pretty much live through the winter because uh, most of them are seven inches. So yes, you can do that. Try it. And forcing bulbs is a whole nother world. I didn't even. Did not even get into that, because <laughs> that's a whole nother world. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that for spring, you plant bulbs in November. For spring blooming bulbs, yes, you plant are them in November. Rules for the summer and fall ones? Yes, there are, but when you get the bulb, they will come with the instructions because everything is very different when you're getting into those odd bulbs that like the fall blooming crocus, they do need to be planted in the springtime so that they can get their roots to grow and then they can put their leaves up and then, no, they bloom and then they put their leaves up for the rest of the winter. Yes, ma'am. The things like spiralins that form the bulb and right. the bulblet, uh -huh. can you use that bulblet and keep the bottom part too? Or do you, I mean, can you divide that? If it's a bulblet on the top, well, bulblets are usually if it's a bulbil, right? Well, is it on the top? You know how the spider lily has the major bulb. And are you talking about a lycoris? The and then, hmm? Are you talking about a lycoris? Yeah. Okay. I mean, can you use that top bulbet, cut it off, and move it over, or is that attachment necessary? I think she might be talking about that lily that you showed that had the little baby on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if yeah. it's not, if it has a little guy on the side of it like that. Yeah, but it's part but of it's, the stem. Like, uh, uh, it should probably come off. I would wait till it ma matures or <coughs> it's starting to die back and see if you can take it off then. Okay. I would think. I don't know, to be perfectly honest. Um, it has a constriction point. It'll it'll pop off on its own. Yeah, but you need to wait until it's mature enough. Yeah, sure. yeah. Because like those little um, bubbles that were on the lily stem. Yes. If you pick them off too early, they're not ripe. You need to wait till they're um, soft and about ready to drop off. Like I said, sometimes you'll even see little roots starting to come off of them. So I'd wait a while. Okay. Yes, sir. You left out one. Uh-oh, I left out a whole bunch. Well, an important one, onions. Oh, well, yes. Well, you know, I, had the, I had the alum up there. I leave a few just for the flowering. Oh, they're beautiful. Right. Yes, right. they are. They're beautiful. Um, yes, yeah, they are fun. I like them. And they're a true bulb. Yes. True bulb. <laughs> what is the name of the researcher you were talking about early on? 
His name was? I believe that first uh, study on your presentation was the one I referenced in the introduction. Oh, okay. Like the trials in North Carolina, 1988. Yes. Uh, Gus, D-E, capital H-E-R-T-O-G-H. Thank you. And his name was August, but they called him Gus. And he worked here. So, yes. It was very interesting because I looked him up and started <coughs> reading about him, and he was very interesting. So, yeah, lots of fun Can things. Can you respell that? Gus, August. Uh, last name is capital D-E, capital H-E-R-T-O-G-H. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Are there some bulbs <coughs> other than daffodils that bulbs will not bother? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to dig up everything we put in our yard. I, I would try the, the, the permatil in there and then they have little wire cages or you can make your own um, but they need to be pretty small then like you know quarter inch wire they, some people say chicken wire but almost everything get through chicken wire um, but yeah I would do something like that if you put wire over top of the bed um, the plants can come through unless they're like a crinum or something which is really huge uh, but all your smaller bulbs can come through that wire and they'll be perfectly fine. But no, I don't know of very many. Um, well, if I'm you sorry. focus on the amaryllis family, that's the one that has the built in toxins and isn't very tasty. Okay, well, the then there, if that's it, then delicacies. that's the, um, there are a lot of amaryllis families. But don't the bulbs come from the bottom? Yeah. They usually come in from the sire molds, or they come, it, yes, some of them come in through tunnels, and some of them just run across the ground and eat the, the stems of plants or trees. I think yeah. they grow all the way around. Oh, oh yeah. A yeah. very good size uh, oak leaf hydrangea and kill it. Yeah. A six foot tall oak leaf hydrangea. They just, they chewed all the way around the base, and once you <coughs> penetrate all the way around, it's hopeless. Yeah, I lost a maple. They just came and yeah. chewed it and I watched it die. Yes, ma'am. Alums, don't they not like alums? The bowls? That's a lily family member, so likely to succumb. <laughs> but likely what? Likely, likely to succumb. <laughs> They'll like it. No, no guarantee, but. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. Oh, no, here I thought I'd found something. <laughs> I don't think they're as tasty as uh, tulips and crocus and stuff, but. My cat kills them. Good for you. <laughs> I used to have a dog that would do that, but he is not with me anymore. So, but he was he was a good he was a good vole catcher. <laughs> yes, sir. I understand you can uh, propagate bulbs like amaryllis by cutting up the basal flower. Oh yes, I read that. They said one article said you could make sixty cuts in an amaryllis bulb. I thought, well, this Christmas I'm going to get one of those $5 <laughs> bulbs and see how many cuts I can do it. But yes, you would need to make sure you get part of the basal plate and then part of the um, uh, growing area. Um, have you done it? No, I'm going to try it though because okay. I had never heard that. I knew that because uh, I have dug up some crinums and uh, other plants like that that have those big bulbs. And if you slice it in half, you can usually take both halves, let them dry so they don't get rotten when you plant them again. Let them dry a little bit, peel up, and then plant them. And almost always, they do just fine. Again, they're a little stunted because they've been abused, but um, they will come back. I've, I have had many crinums that we've dug up, because you never know what crinum bulbs are, and dug them up and had them scarred, and they do just fine. So I'm going to try it. I, I think it'll be lots of fun. The other thing, and I'm not real sure, nothing up here I think will work, but with the lilies that have the scales, is it true that you can take a scale and start it's, it? It's the same process. I don't think any of these will because they were pretty, pretty sad because um, either the last of the bulbs for the season. Um, but I thought I'd try that too because I got a couple of them here. And y'all are welcome to take pieces and take whatever you want. The, ba the basal plate is a condensed stem. And as a stem where every leaf attaches has a bud, so you cut it in pieces, you're just doing stem cuttings. And you can put them in a bag of um, like a somewhat moist potting soil and refrigerate them, and that little bud will turn into a new bulb. 
And that's the way you can mass produce bulbs. But you obviously are sacrificed cutting up to a million pieces <laughs> to get little tiny babies. <laughs> they have to grow out and they get bigger. But that is how you mass multiply your bulbs. Is this a novice kind of project? It, it, it's a very simple process to do. Okay. Yeah. So Chris, I had read that you should take each of those divisions and dip them in a 10% Clorox to kind of help get reduce the fungus. Problem with fungus. Probably, yeah, or okay. just the general fungicide. Yeah, you're, that's you're what they, nice I just, they just said fungicide, yeah. so, yeah. Okay. And the uh, the bulb that you sell, the lily, it's just more accessible. It, it's like an onion blossom at the restaurant. It, they're easier to peel. A, true, uh, a tunicate bulb is just really, really tight. It's harder to get into. But, yeah, it's, it's neat that, that they are stems. I mean, that's just rhizomes or stems, and they... You just usually you think of stem as just something that comes up. You don't think about it going underneath the ground and being food storage. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So quite, I'm talking about lilies. Uh, when the World Wide Web said that uh, pack your, uh, pack your calla lilies, leaving a uh, corner of the bulb above the earth's surface. I would not do that, not well, in this area. <laughs> that might have been. They're all right, but they're not, they're not great. That um, might have been pot culture too. Yeah, um, there there is a difference between if you if you're going to grow them indoors because those that's something you can force, um, but outdoors because they are marginal in this area, I would make sure they are a little bit deeper than than just at the soil level. Yes, sir. Is anybody here trying bulbs in cans with both ends cut out? No. Oh, you're talking about to protect the bulb? Yes. Oh. We have no. bulbs really bad, as my wife said. And I've got an experiment running, taking number 10 cans, cutting the top and the bottom off, and putting the with your drill, drill a hole, put the can in the hole, leave about an inch above the ground, put some potting soil in the bottom, put the bulb in, fill it up with potting soil, and wait. And it's worked this year. Sounds <laughs> sounds like it's worth a try because they're going to bump into it down low, and then if it's up above the soil, they're going to bump into it there. They don't try to, um, there's not enough space for them to come down. Well, they also, if they're hopping over things, they're exposing themselves to right. the hawks and the owls and everything they else. They this year, anyway. Well, that's very cool. It'd be interesting to see next year how it works. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> anything else? Well, thank you very much. I've had a great time. <laughs>